This video gives an introduction to the analysis of state space systems. The first two sections then looked at the definitions of state space models and the computation of underlying behaviours. And a state space model is given by something like this x dot equals ax plus bu, where x is a vector of states, u is a vector of inputs, and then y equals cx plus du, where y is a vector of outputs. What we want to do now is analyse the behaviours of systems like this a little bit more carefully. What we're going to do first is look at stability, and then in the later videos we're going to introduce concepts of controllability and observability. Stability then. This is a word that's used quite a lot in control, and often it's used rather carelessly. Now, I'm not too worried about that, but what we're going to do here is attempt to give some slightly more rigorous definitions because every now and then you will need these definitions and the usage that people have in common language um, may not be precise enough. <coughs> so we want to look at concepts of convergence and stable equilibrium and concepts of bounded input, bounded output, bounded input, bounded state. Equilibrium then. One core test is whether there exists an equilibrium point such that the state remains at this point once it gets there. And also, for stability, what you'd like is that the state converges to this equilibrium point if it happens to be at any point nearby. And I'm not going to define what I mean by nearby because that's not needed. <coughs> Now the definitions for equilibrium are obvious in that the state must not move. Hence, if we take a continuous time state space model, then assuming the states at the equilibrium point, which I've taken to be the origin for convenience, or no, sorry, at the equilibrium point, x dot must be zero, i.e. the state must not be moving, so the state derivative has to be zero. So that means ax plus bu must be zero. Similarly, if you take a discrete system, you have an update equation, which is xk plus 1 equals axk plus buk. So if you're at an equilibrium point, the new state must be the same as the current state. And therefore, you end up with the condition axk plus buk equals xk, defines the equilibrium. Now, different constant values for u will give different equilibria points, and that's obvious because u occurs in these equations. But for convenience in this series, we're likely to take u equals 0 when we're talking about equilibrium. Because these are linear systems, you can always use superposition anyway, so this is a rather um, minor point. Stable equilibrium. This is a particular definition that students should be aware of, and it's defined using norms and establishes that once the state is within a certain distance, again I've not been too precise about what I mean by certain, but once it's within a certain distance of the equilibrium point, thereafter it can never go further away again than another specified relative distance. Now if we put this in maths it's a bit easier to follow. You'll notice that this does not imply convergence, but what it does imply is boundedness, because we've said it can only go a certain distance away from this equilibrium point. And here's a mathematical expression. So what we've said is if x of t is within delta of a particular point, and we're using the origin for convenience, so we've said if the norm of x of t is less than delta, then for all future times, that's why I've put t plus t1, x of t, or the norm of x of t, must remain within r delta. Now, r is a scalar factor to be determined, and we're not going to worry about um, actually calculating these here. Um, but what you'll notice is for linear systems, this r is actually independent of the magnitude of x, but if you have a nonlinear system, the relationships are somewhat more complicated. Now, the interesting thing about the definition of a stable equilibrium 
that we've used here is that it allows for permanent oscillation. So we haven't said that x of t converges to a specific point. We've said that it remains within a given distance of a given point, and therefore permanent oscillation is permitted with this definition. What about asymptotically stable equilibrium? Well, this has added an extra word, and so what's the difference? Well, the difference here is that this means the state actually converges to the equilibrium point. In other words, if we take the origin for convenience, we're saying the limit as t goes to infinity of the norm of x of t must be zero. So adding this asymptotically um, to the definition, we now insist on convergence to the equilibrium point. For nonlinear systems, there are some nuances, and we're not really wanting to discuss nonlinear systems here. But a key point is that an asymptotically stable equilibrium does not allow oscillatory modes. Bounded input, bounded state. This means that assuming the input is bounded beneath some value, which you can specify, then you can guarantee that the state is also bounded beneath another norm, which you can specify. So again, if we write that in mathematics, you'll see if we assume that the norm of the input is less than delta for all future times, then we can show that the norm of the state is less than or equal to epsilon for all future times. And this is a definition of bounded input, bounded state. So if you can establish an epsilon and a delta such that these relationships hold, then you have bounded input, bounded state stability. In general, these norms may depend upon the initial condition. And for convenience, we might say, let's just assume the initial condition is 0. But for linear systems, you can actually get fairly precise numbers if you want. But we don't need them here. We're just worried about definitions. The key point is that the state remains bounded. And because the state remains bounded, it cannot diverge to infinity. So this is a very useful result. Bounded input bounded output. Now this is slightly more relaxed than bounded state because if we define the output as being c times x, then what you'll notice is it's possible for y to be bounded and x to be unbounded as long as the unbounded part of x lies in the kernel of the matrix c. So if I write this here, you could have c into x1 plus x2, which I could have cx1 plus 0. So if x2 is in the kernel of c, it doesn't map to the output. So x2 could be as large as we like. So this def definition illustrates a danger. That is, observing or guaranteeing the stability of the output y does not necessarily imply the stability of the system states. And that's why it's important that when you're using your definitions, you think about are you doing a bounded input, bounded state, or are you doing bounded input, bounded output, because they have different repercussions. Linear state space systems then. So now we want to look at these definitions and apply them to state space models. We're going to separate into two different types of behavior. We're going to look at forced behavior. So this is when the input is non-zero. And for this, it's appropriate to use a beeps or Bebo analysis. The other um, possible motion is free mode, which is where the input is zero. And for this, it's more appropriate to use an asymptotic stability analysis. Let's remind ourselves then of how the system behaves. So here's a state space model. If you find the eigenvalues of the matrix A and put them in lambda, then it can be shown that for a constant u, I've emphasized that up here, that the behavior x of t takes this form below. So you have a constant which associates with the u, and then you have modes associated to each eigenvalue. So the free mode then. If the input is 0, then we can get rid of that k, and this is the sort of behavior that we've got. The asymptotic, asymptotic stability requires that all the exponentials have to have negative real exponents because you remember asymptotic stability said we want this condition. We want that the limit as t goes to infinity of x of t goes to zero and therefore that condition has to apply to each term inside 
this x of t. And the only way that can happen is, is, is if each of these exponentials converges to 0, and that will only happen if the real part of the lambda i's is strictly less than 0. If you wanted to allow some oscillation, and hence you just wanted stability rather than asymptotic stability, then you would end up with this requirement. You'll see that now the real part of lambda is less than or equal to zero. So you're going to allow the eigenvalues to go onto the imaginary axis, but obviously not into the right half plane. What about the force mode? When the input is non-zero, then usually what you're adding is some signal here, but you've still got all these other components which should get excited by the forced mode. So if you're going to do bounded input, bounded state, you still require asymptotic stability. And you might be thinking, just a minute, <coughs> why do we need asymptotic stability? Because bounded input, bounded state suggests that we can go up to a, uh, we don't have to converge to a specific point. So why can't we just have a stability result? Well, this is the reason. Eigenvalues have to be strictly inside the left half plane because if you have a sinusoidal input mode in u of t <coughs> that matches an eigenvalue of your system, then you're going to create a resonance or a repeated pole. And obviously, if you create a resonance, you'll notice you get this t term in the response, t sine omega t, and that's divergent, so it's no longer bounded. So if you want a bounded input, bounded state result, then actually your eigenvalues must be strictly inside the left half plane. So you'll notice that's a slightly stronger requirement than on the previous slide. Now, it's possible that the input will not excite some of the modes where the lambda is on the imaginary axis. And therefore, you could relax this condition for those modes. So if you know that the input is not exciting certain modes, you could relax this condition. And we'll give an example. This goes back to the previous section where we looked at behaviors of state space models. And you remember, we said the forced behavior could be captured by an expression a bit like this, where the wi are the eigenvectors, the vi are the left eigenvectors, the lambda i are the eigenvalues. Now, I'm not going to rederive that expression because it's in the previous videos. But <coughs> here's the key point. If we look at this expression, you'll notice that there's some beta i terms here. And why is that important? If beta i equals 0, then the associated mode, which is this exponential here, cannot be excited by the input. And if that's the case, then you could still get a bounded input, bounded state result, even if that particular eigenvalue, lambda i, was on the imaginary axis. So B burstability. Now, what's the difference here is the previous slide did B did bounded input, bounded state. And now we're saying, OK, let's look at bounded input, bounded output. Now, there's only one subtle difference from what I've done on the previous slide. We've introduced this matrix C here. But that means we've now introduced this variable here, gamma i, which is CWI. And that gives us a slightly different insight, because now when you look at the responses, You'll see there's a gamma i there, there's a beta i transposed here, and in between them is the ith mode. So, first of all, if either gamma i is 0 or beta i is 0, then the associated mode is either not excited or is not observed. And hence, you can give a bounded input, bounded output result, even if that eigenvalue is on the imaginary axis. What about extensions to the discrete case? And we'll do these fairly quickly because they're largely analogous to the continuous case. First, then, a reminder of the system behaviors, which we're not going to rederive because they're in the previous section. But you'll see you can do your free response phi n, which takes this form, and your step response hn, which takes this form here. And you can therefore substitute these in, and you can get a generic expression for how their future states behave. 
Now when the input is zero, you've got the free mode. So here's the free mode behavior, and you'll notice this is pretty much analogous to the continuous time system, except now we've got these lambda 1 to the n, lambda 2 to the n, lambda n to the n, and so on. So asymptotic stability requires that all the eigenvalues are strictly inside the unit circle, because asymptotic stability requires that you converge to zero here, and that will only happen if the modulus of each of these lambda i's are strictly less than 1. If you wanted to allow some pure oscillation, then you can get a stability result as opposed to an asymptotic stability result. And for this, you could al allow the eigenvalues to lie on the unit circle, but not outside. So in other words, you could get a simple stability result if you use the criteria modulus of lambda i less than or equal to 1. So you'll see that the results here are exactly analogous to what we did in continuous time. <coughs> what about the force mode? Well, again, you'll see we've got analogous types of um, definitions for the behavior. So when the input mode is... So let's go and look first at a Beebs result, bounded input, bounded state. This exactly analogous to continuous time requires an asymptotic stability result and it's for exactly the same reason that we gave before which if your input signal includes a mode which is the same as the mode which goes with for example a given eigen mode then you're going to get divergence and therefore if you want a Beebs result so bounded input, bounded state result, then you need the modulus of lambda i is strictly less than 1. Because if you allow the modulus of lambda i equal to 1, it's possible that an input mode will overlap with that and you'll get a divergent signal. Now, as before, there are, of course, some exceptions. So again, this is exactly analogous to what we did in the continuous time system. If you look at the state predictions, they're given here, you'll notice there's a beta i term. And if that beta i is 0, then the corresponding mode, lambda i, is not excited. Similarly, if you look at the output predictions, you'll notice there's a gamma i term and a beta i term. You'll recognize these exactly the same as we put in the continuous time example. And if either of those are zero, this mode is not observed or excited in the output. So what's the summary we've got? If beta i is zero, the associated mode is not excited by the input, and hence you could still get a bounded input, bounded state result with the corresponding eigenvalue on the imaginary axis. So in other words, beta i equals 0 means that lambda i could be less than or equal to 1 as opposed to strictly less than 1. And similarly, if either gamma i is 0 or beta i is 0, the associated mode is either not excited or not observed in the output, and hence you could give a bounded input, bounded output result with the corresponding eigenvalue on the unit circle. So in summary, we've introduced concepts of stability and noted that depending on the requirement, eigenvalues must either be strictly in the left half plane or they can lie on the imaginary axis. And you have equivalent definitions for the discrete time system. Of particular note is, the, is that bounded input, bounded state result implies a bounded input, bounded output result, but not vice versa. So you could have a Bebo result and yet not a Beebs result. And similarly, you've noticed that asymptotic stability implies stability, but not vice versa. So stability allows oscillatory modes, but asymptotic stability does not. <coughs>